All right. Yeah, one way the other day. Well, I think that's, uh, if anybody comes in late, that's their problem, not ours. <laughs> so, so if, so if I understand, time. so if I understand correctly, um, then we'll do like, um, you know, Brenda mentioned before, we'll do uh, a cocktail and then, uh, you know, a pause with the presentation of the, the book and the food pairing. And then I'll go back with a cocktail and then again and yeah. again and again. Yep. Yep. Okay, yep. great. I, right, think we're so. skip, I think we're skipping the food though. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It'll be Noah, then me, then Cindy. So okay. I'll, I'll do the pairing. Willie, you can show us your drinking shirt. Oh, let's see, Willie. Oh, oh, oh that's excellent. Good. Look at Willie. Can everyone see Willie? Oh, <laughs> that's extra, Willie. That's really I good. Forgot I had it in the drawer until we got <laughs> yours. Uh, so but why don't we get started? Oh, uh, on my chest. <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask people to mute for now, but um, if if you want to, in between, you know, this presenter's talking, you want to talk about the drink, you can share it in the chat, or you can unmute and say, oh, wow, this is delicious, or this tastes terrible, but we're not going to say that, though. Um, and, uh, but so I I'd ask everyone to, to mute for now, and I'm going to turn it over to our three fabulous presenters. Thank you, Noah. Noah, you go first. Okay. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Noah King-Smith. I work for uh, Slocum & Sons, which is, uh, if you guys are all from the greater Wallingford area, we're a North Haven-based company for, oh my gosh, over, since pro, pre-prohibition, pre actually. Um, it, the original location was West Haven, but we've been in uh, North Haven um, on corporate drive since the 70s, uh, the late 70s. And um, we're a family-owned company. And we've got a mega wine and spirit book. Uh, and I'm a key account manager for Slocum, which means uh, I, I visit um, restaurants and, and some, you know, different stores to, uh, to present our portfolio. And but most notably in the past 10 years or so with the rise of the craft cocktail boom, uh, I've basically been tasked to take our unique ingredients and go out to the trade in, in mostly restaurants and, and bars to to put them to, to use and, and, and make an application for them so that they could uh, you know, use some pretty esoteric ingredients. Um, and I don't mean esoteric in terms of category always, um, I, I mean brands even. So we're so, such a brand centric uh, society um, that, that uh, and, and I'll, I'll get right off, right off the bat, I will, um, I'll point out what I'm talking about there. So for the, the Spritz Veneziano, we call it the Spritz Veneziano, but in reality, it's the Aperol Spritz. So we've Aperol. all heard of that probably at yes. this point. Yes. Aperol is just a brand like Kleenex or Q-tip, but this it's a cotton swab, right? Well, this is an aperitivo, an Italian red orange based aperitivo. So we're going to use Luxardo's aperitivo to make our Spritz tonight. So we call it, it's from Venice, that cocktail originally. And we're going to call it the uh, Spritz Veneziano. And so with that, um, I know the recipe that, that might have been shared with you uh, is an ounce and a quarter. But we're going to get really technical and use some ounce measurements for the rest of the cocktails. Then the first two, the Spritz and the Sangria, will be pretty simple. And this is kind of like a, uh, you know, let's eyeball an ounce and a quarter, you know, right into the wine glass. Something like that. Or if you like it sweeter. Uh, a little richer, you can add more, um, but that's that's pretty simple there. And then we're gonna add uh, a bit of ice uh, to that glass. All right, we're gonna swirl it around to chill it. That's pretty simple too. No fancy bar spoons, just a wine glass and uh, and uh, a swirl. And then we're gonna top it with, uh, I'm using Mianetto Prosecco tonight. We're gonna top it with Prosecco. I would say here maybe like a four to one. So like I would say roughly four ounces of Prosecco, something like that, right on top. And then we're gonna use just a bit of soda water and just do a little splash of soda to cut it. Really, that's it. And, uh, and then we could, take, we could take a bar spoon at this point and just stir up from the bottom, if you'd like, just to kind of incorporate the wine and the soda and the uh, actual liqueur in there. And then the classic uh, garnish would be an orange, just a slice of orange. It could, be, it could be a wheel of orange if you want, but just a little, little slice like that. 
uh, and you can just squeeze a little fresh orange juice on the top and then drop that right in the top. And that's the Spritz Veneziano. Cheers. 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 That looks really good. The, the perfect thing to start Cheers. an event with, the perfect thing to start a meal with. It's what most of Italy, all of New York, LA, Chicago, Miami, it's, it's a, it's believe it or not, it's a hot ingredient. Luger? Yeah. And that's shark. That's mama shark. Oh. I look behind baby shark. Okay, so um, Noah said, you know, you can enjoy this almost morning, noon, and night. Uh, but some of the things that you want to pair with the spritz that go really well with it are any kind of nibbly things. Crostini with just about any topping that you can imagine. Um, mini meatballs, herby marinated olives, uh, prosciutto wrapped around melon is a great pairing. Uh, French fries or potato chips. I mean, you don't have to get fancy. Uh, a spritz is also a great excuse to make a cheese board and just go all out with all kinds of cheeses, cold cuts, olives, um, nuts, crackers. You can't go wrong with this. I, it, it pairs with just about anything. So Cindy, what book are we pairing with? Okay, hold on a second. We are pairing this, this one with The City of Fallen Angels by John Barron. Um, if you can see this screen, let me see if I can make it bigger. There we go. Um, uh, John Barron wrote a book called Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, which, which should take you back probably something like 25 years but it was on the New York Times bestseller list for a whopping four years, which at that point, not a single novel or nonfiction book had ever done. Um, that one was set in New Orleans and it made John Barron sort of famous. Um, and this book, The City of Falling Angels, is his, the first book he wrote after Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. And it is set in Venice, which is why I picked it as the pairing since, um, since this aperitivo uh, is a Venezia, um, Veneziano. Um, and the book is about um, the, a fire, a massive fire in 1996 that destroyed the uh, Venice's historic opera house. Um, I'm not gonna pronounce it. I don't, if anyone on, on the call speaks Italian, it's F-E-N-I-C-E. -E. I would say Fenice. Um, that and sounds good. That sounds good, let's go with that. Um, and he, he, the book is about what was behind that fire. Um, and if you read Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, and by the way, if you haven't, I recommend it. Um, he's really good on atmosphere. And so this book will make you feel like you're in Venice, which is a perfect, perfect place to sip um, a spritz. So that's my suggestion for the spritz Veneziano. I think we're ready for this second cocktail from Noah. Okay. Uh, sangria, so, right? Yeah. So the next one's going to be a sangria. Um, this is a pretty simple drink. Um, sangria is kind of what you want to make of it, but I'm going to make the classic and then we can talk about a couple of variations. And what sangria is, uh, is taking a dry wine. I mean, it doesn't have to be dry, but that's what's classic. It could have, it could be a, it could be a Riesling. It could be a, uh, a, a, you know, sort of a modern sweet red, um, if you want, I might just omit the sweeter ingredients I'm about to show you. Um, one of which is, um, uh, a, uh, triple sec it's by Luxardo. Um, and, uh, so basically we're going to build it, uh, all in the glass. So we can take, um, we can take, uh, you could take a wine glass. You could take a pint glass, a rest some restaurants do pint glasses. Uh, that works just fine. Um, but I would take a, I would take a chilled glass. The wine could be chilled as well. This, this wine happens not to be chilled, but I'm the only one tasting it tonight. So 
but I would, if you were going to do, do a red or a white, even I, I would even chill a red wine. Um, and then, uh, so red wine straight into, uh, the wine glass. Always want to take that just like we did before and, and chill that down really quick. And then what's classic is a Spanish brandy. So we're going to use Lepanto Spanish brandy. Uh, and I would say to something like this, we're going to fortify it, right? By using about a half ounce of brandy. And then about, I'd say to properly balance this, uh, I'd say a full ounce of triple sec. And we could stir with a bar spoon, but like I said, we're going to be doing that with some fancier drinks in a minute. Uh, this is, it's fine just to take that wine glass, you know, and, and give it a swirl like that. And then really what sells people on, um, sangrias is the fresh fruit on the surface. So, uh, just chopping a bunch of fresh fruit for the surface, um, and, and floating that in. So this is just one like slice of chopped apple right in on top of that. And then naturally, right? We're it's a grape based cocktail. So we could just take and have a couple of grapes, uh, white grapes in this case for contrast is nice, uh, and drop those, uh, in on the surface. Um, and, uh, so that, that would kind of be your classic sangria. Uh, but from there, um, well, let's taste it, see how it turned out. I I'm the one having the fun tonight, I guess, uh, the most fun anyway. Um, yeah, so that, that's pretty balanced. Um, and you could even add a touch of citrus if you wanted. Lemon juice is welcome. Uh, but as far as variation goes, um, white uh, sangria would be fine. Uh, a flavored liqueur of some sort would be fitting. Uh, peach liqueur, apricot liqueur, um, elderflower, like we all might. That's kind of been a popular thing the past few years. Uh, St. Germain or, or something like that um, that everybody would know. Uh, and, and, and then sort of the possibilities are endless. All you're trying to do is balance the dry wine by sweetening it, fortifying it to make it a cocktail with brandy, and then uh, flavoring it how you see fit and what's to your taste. Uh, so that would really be it with a, with a sangria. Common to uh, Spain, a, a, a usage for some sort of stale old wine behind the bar. Uh, and they said, well, if we put a splash of brandy in it and a little bit of sugar and then chop some fruit, it's a, it's a nice cooling cocktail for some hot weather to use up some of that, uh, that slightly oxidized wine. So cheers. Cheers. Um, so to pair sangria again, this was easy. It's no surprise that sangria is very popular in Spain. Um, where they have tapas, little small uh, plates of appetizers that are meant to be shared. So, um, you know, anything that you can serve in a small plate, small dishes of pasta, uh, appetizers, mini meatballs, um, again, cheese, olives, um, you can get as fancy as you want or as simple as you want. Um, and it's, it's, it's also good, you know, at a picnic or a barbecue. Um, all right, so I, before I do the next book, I just want to say I'm putting links in the chat to the libraries where you can find each of these books in the library's catalog. Um, so I put The City of Falling Angels and also Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. And since Karen pointed out that the movie of Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil was good, which it was, we also have the movie in the catalog. So I put the links to all three of those in the chat. Okay. Um, the next book, you know, you got to just love this title. Um, but Mama Always Put Vodka in the Sangria. Um, Adventures in Eating, Drinking, and Making Merry. Julia Reed, um, who very sadly died last year, um, was a hoot of a woman. Um, she lived in Mississippi and in New Orleans. 
uh, and was um, a columnist and contributing editor for a magazine. This is a real magazine called Garden and Gun, um, very popular in the South. And she wrote a column called The High and the Low. And she's pu uh, published a series of books that compile those columns that are predominantly about eating and drinking, um, eating and drinking Southern style. So the stuff that goes on that she writes about the parties, the conversations, the, the vast quantities of booze and the craziness of the food, it's all captured in these columns. Uh, and this book is of course, just the title is enough for me, um, plus the very, very pretty picture of a picture of sangria. If you, if you watch, if you have Netflix, um, you can watch an incredible food show called Somebody Feed Phil, which I've talked about before. Um, she appears prominently in the New Orleans episode and also one of the more, more recent episodes, which I suspect was filmed shortly before she died. So um, uh, she was a very special woman and the essays are a joy. Um, and so I recommend, but mama always put vodka in the sangria, which by the way, all mamas should do. So that's the pairing. That's the book pairing for sangria. And I'm not, I'm not completely against that. We could put vodka in the sangria. There you that, would go. Be that, that would be fine. There you go. Okay. Uh, so Brenda, could, would you remind me of the next drink? Are we okay. making the- The Hello? next one should be the Midnight Mojito. The Midnight Mojito, okay. Let's, uh, let's get that one going. All right, so uh, this is, uh, a mo Mojito is a very simple rum drink. It's three ingredients. It's like the rum version of the original margarita. All it is is a spiritus ingredient, a sour ingredient, and a sweet ingredient. So a, a classic mojito is white rum, two parts, one part sugar, one part lime juice. So we're going to call this one a midnight mojito because normally mojitos, you notice, are uh, nice and clear. Uh, they're you know sort of brilliant. They're sparkling. There's mint floating in it. But we're going to use an awesome uh, rum called bamboo. Uh, and bamboo is a, uh, a dark rum. And uh, it's a little bit... Uh, on the sweet side, and it's a little bit on the spiced side, um, but it, it definitely plays well uh, with mint uh, as as well as the classic. So, um, and I broke the cork on that. But one of the most notable things about this bottle is it's got this really cool cork that I was so excited to open for you because it makes this incredible noise. Um, but it, that's not going to be in the cards tonight, unfortunately. So sorry about that. Uh, okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to take a couple pieces of uh, lime. Uh, I, I'd say like uh, an entire lime cut up into, uh, into wedges uh, right in the bottom of the pint glass. We're going to take a little bit of simple uh, sugar syrup. You can use... Uh, you know, uh, actual fine sugar and muddle it like crazy. But I, I don't really find um, that it's terribly necessary. I, I think if you've got, um, if you've got good, fresh, uh, fresh limes, um, and if you just press them with the skins, release the juice and the oils in the bottom of the pint glass, um, and you really don't have to mangle it, um, that's, that's uh, perfectly fine. So I would start by doing that, and then from there add fresh mint. I would say something like, uh, something like eight leaves uh, would be would be fitting. So that in the bottom of the uh, the glass as well, and you just want to kind of break those uh, mint leaves up gently, not to where they're pulverized, but to where all their oils are released. Uh, we stir that around the pint glass, uh, and then we're gonna add two ounces of bamboo rum. We're gonna to top it up with ice. We're 
you can stir it uh, or shake it through uh, a bit like that. Then we're gonna strain it into a tall Collins glass like this here. You know why they call it a Collins glass? Does anybody know? Unmute yourself in a little trivia. Collins glass, anybody know why? So who's heard of a Tom Collins? So a Tom Collins is a, a classic gin cocktail uh, with lemon juice, simple syrup, and soda water. Uh, and that's the classic cocktail. When they made it, they used to put it in this glass, this tall cylindrical glass. And that became named the Collins glass because of that cocktail. Uh, all right, so we've taken the uh, we've taken the drink and strained it out. Now, I don't like pulling mint out of my teeth. There's plenty of mint now in that cocktail because we stirred it through. So then I take full leaves of mint. We're gonna put that straight into the glass and then top up with ice. Stir that cold. And then I'm gonna take a bit of, you could use regular soda water, but tonight we, we don't sell this one, but I'm, I'm very fond of Fever Tree. They make great tonic waters and club sodas and flavored sodas. And this is a yuzu lime soda. It's, very, it's, it's not super sweet, it's pretty dry, uh, but it's a little citrusy. So I like to take that and top up. And then once again, anytime we top with something sparkling, we take and pull up that drink from the bottom, just like that to incorporate it. And the one thing I did forget was a straw. So we're gonna pretend like this is a, uh, a straw and it's a bamboo skewer, but uh, that would be it. And then take a nice sprig, fresh sprig of mint right on the surface of the drink like this. And there we have the uh, midnight mojito with bamboo rum. Bamboo rum is delicious. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, it's also good in, in iced tea. Yeah, it's got a vanilla, it's got a spice and vanilla note. It's, mm -hmm. it's very nice in tea. Yeah, it plays nicely with other things, which is always fun. In yeah, a, that, that came out great. Um, okay, so pairings. Um, Dark rum, any kind of rum. When you make a mojito, whether it's midnight mojito or regular mojito, they play very well with spicy foods, um, Caribbean foods, jerk chicken, um, uh, spicy American barbecue, or um, uh, American style brisket, which is goes really well with this. Um, so while there's still some summer left if you've got a backyard and you've got a barbecue grill i say go for it make this drink and then throw something on there and don't be afraid to add some spice to it can i add cuban sandwich absolutely yes wow that's that's like a great 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 pairing yeah classic a classic pairing okay um, the book for this one was, this was actually the first book I chose, um, The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. Um, so it's, you know, it's Hemingway, so it's classic, but he's really easy to read. And this is not a long book at all. Um, it's the story of an old Cuban fisherman um, and his battle with a giant marlin far out in the Gulf Stream. That's all you really need to know about the book other than it's by Ernest Hemingway. But why would I have picked this to pair with a mojito? Um, the answer to that is that th this is the story and I've decided it should be true because it's a great story. Hemingway had a skipper. Hemingway was out on the water a lot and had a skipper named Gregorio Fuentes. And Gregorio, created a drink that he called Gregorio's Rx whenever Hemingway was a little under the weather. The ingredients of the drink, rum, lime juice, mint leaves, and honey syrup. 
So I've decided that's awfully close to a mojito. Um, Gregorio is believed to be one of the inspirations for Santiago, the main character in The Old Man in the Sea. So I've decided that that, that works for me as a connection that you would drink a mojito, toast to Hemingway and to Gregorio um, and read Old Man and the Sea. So that's the pairing for this one. And so that's interesting you say that, uh, honey syrup. Uh, and the reason for that, the original cocktails in uh, the islands in Cuba, before really the advent of highly refined sugars, uh, it was common to use a sweetener such as honey. That was more, more naturally available uh, before uh, refined sugars. There's earlier recipes of you know, pressed sugar cane as well, making uh, mojitos, but honey was not uncommon. So Noah, you're making the Paloma? Yeah, I'm just squeezing the grapefruit juice right now. When I say fresh, I mean fresh. I also mean I was stuck in 95 traffic this afternoon and I didn't get home in chance time to, uh, <laughs> to squeeze the uh, grapefruit juice. Uh, so I, I want everybody to unmute and, and, and put in their vote here. What's the most popular tequila cocktail in Mexico? Margarita. 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 Paloma. Paloma. Who said Paloma? Who said Paloma? If you say Paloma, you're right. Mar margarita is an American cocktail. Yeah, so Margarita was actually invented uh, uh, in San Diego. <laughs> uh, it, it's drunk pretty heavily in Mexico these days. But um, what's really the most popular uh, cocktail in Mexico is a Paloma. Um, so for that, today we're going to use a Blanco Tequila by Luna Azul. This is a family-owned distillery. Did I make That's a state-grown agave, a state distilled, and a state bottled. Uh, not many producers can say that. Um, and then uh, it, it's pretty simple because we're gonna use a little bit of sugar, uh, grapefruit soda and fresh grapefruit juice. But it needs to be red grapefruit, right? A lot of bars don't have red grapefruit juice. Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, a lot of bars also don't squeeze fresh juice, but as you could see here, uh, we're doing it the right way. And uh, yeah, it does have to be the, the, the ruby red or pink, you know, pink grapefruit juice. Yeah, that's kind of what's classic. All right. So into the mixing glass or to the shaker, the pint glass portion of the Boston shaker, uh, we're going to take uh, two ounces of Lunazul Blanco tequila. And I would just like to follow along with the, uh, the recipe here that you guys have. So for this one, I'm gonna use an ounce of that grapefruit juice, a half ounce of fresh lime juice, because grapefruit juice is great, brings bitterness, brings sweetness, but it doesn't bring a lot of acidity. So I like a little bit of lime juice. So Boston Shaker and You don't have to shake it that hard. It's going to be served on ice. So there's gonna be further dilution. And if you over dilute it in the tin, 
it's going to be watery by the time it's halfway, you know, consumed. So if I could find the strainer here, we're going to go into another Collins glass, a tall glass like this. This is a fine mesh strainer. It catches all the broken up ice. This is my favorite, favorite trick to show people. That little strainer here, it caught a whole bunch of ice. And that ice is a sign of bad bartending, even though people get a kick out of maybe crunching ice as it floats on the surface of their drink. But what this does is it ends up floating and coating the surface of the, the drink because it's the lightest uh, you know, ingredient in that cocktail. Uh, and then it closes down the aromatics and then your first sip is water. So this is a highly specialized tool, but it's very simple to use. It's just a conical mesh strainer. It could be anything really. I mean, if you wanna take the drain out of your sink and use that, it's, it, it's better than uh, serving ice in the top of your cocktail, in my opinion. Uh, but we're gonna add that first and that's about a four ounce drink in the bottom of that glass. I'm gonna top that up about 70% or 75% of the way full with uh, ice. Uh, and then we're gonna use grapefruit soda to top it up, just like that. And so just like a margarita, um, you know, you can salt it, that's optional. You know, uh, if you like salt, a half salt rim, a full salt rim, whatever. But once again, I reiterate that if we have put something sparkling on top, soda water or sparkling wine. We just go to the bottom with the spoon and pull up that drink. Don't stir it to flatten it. Just gently lift the drink from the bottom to the top. Uh, and, uh, you know, we could take a nice uh, piece of lime here. What's sometimes fitting is a, de a, is a depressed lime like that. And depends on how crazy you want to get. Maybe we take and make a make it a little miniature shot glass, and the surface of the drink has a little shot glass when you uh, when you, you start off. But that'd be another one uh, served with a uh, straw. You could do that like that, and that is the Paloma, the number one consumed drink in Mexico. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, uh, okay. that that was impressive. I just want to say. <laughs> Thank you. I like the little shot at the end. Yeah, that was big. Yeah, you know, that's that's that's, that's like called. Yeah, that's called, um, you know, alcoholism. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so Paloma being the most popular drink in Mexico, no surprise that this pairs well with Mexican food, um, tacos, nachos, Real tacos, um, not the stuff we buy in a kit, although that, that would work. Um, fajitas, anything that's salty, anything that's grilled. Um, try it with grilled hot dogs or grilled kielbasa. Trust me, it, it works. Um, so this one, this one's easy uh, to pair as well. Like all of these, all of these cocktails are. So Cindy, what book are we going to have with it? Okay, so I don't know if, or if anyone else made this association, but when I um, thought about this drink, the first person I thought of was Paloma Picasso, who is Picasso's daughter with Francoise Gillot. Uh, and so this book, Life with Picasso by Francoise Gillot, was, um, uh, she, she was an, an amazing woman she was, uh, she was in her early 20s when she met Picasso, who at the time was in his early 60s in 1943. Um, she was uh, brought up in a very uh, well-to-do uh, family. She went to Cambridge University and was educated there and at the Sorbonne. Um, her family expected her to go into law uh, and she wanted to be an artist. And she, um, she and Picasso were first friends and then lovers and were together for 10 years. And she had two children with him, Claude and Paloma. 
Um, and she was also, in addition to being the mother of his children, she was one of his muses. Um, and she tried very hard, nevertheless, with all of that and with what it must have been like to be with him, um, she was determined to be her own woman. So this is her memoir of her time with Picasso. And again, I picked it because as soon as I heard about the Paloma, I, for, for whatever reason, I associated it with Paloma Picasso, which um, there's a, this is a complete non sequitur, but there's a perfume called Paloma, um, uh, which may, for all I know, I should have looked this up, be made by Paloma Picasso. And I'll look into that while we're working on the next drink. But anyway, that's the, that's the book pairing for the Paloma. So the next drink that Noah is going to make is, I believe, the bee's knees. My favorite, since I'm a big uh, gin drinker, um, and it's the it's the now I know what I know what at least half of you are saying right now. Uh, oh God, I don't like gin. Right, I'm, I'm the, although if that's not the case, if it's not if it's, it's more than half of you that like gin, then I'm in the right group of people here. Um, I, I'm a big gin fan. I think gin is misunderstood completely. Um, we're using a classic London dry gin here called Brokers. Oh boy, best value in, uh, in London dry gin. Totally killer stuff. Uh, also independently owned by two brothers, uh, the Dawson brothers. Uh, of, of London and uh, 94 proof, a full 47% alcohol. And uh, we're going to use pretty simple ingredients here. So honey syrup and lemon juice. That's it. So it'll be a 211. And honey syrup, all that is, is straight honey diluted like five to one with hot water, something like that. For this drink to get viscosity, to get a nice mouthfeel, you don't want to make it two to one or even three to one. Basically, just thin it out so it's flowable, you know, so it, it moves for you. Um, and that's really it. So I'm going to do, use a jigger for this one because there's a big difference between an ounce and an ounce and a quarter of, you know, honey syrup and the same thing with fresh lemon juice. It makes a big difference. So a full ounce of honey syrup goes into the pint glass. Then a full ounce of freshly squeezed lemon juice, always fresh. And then two ounces of Broker's London Dry Gin. I don't always use my hands, but I'm home and I'm actually not serving these to anyone else at the moment. My family is out. Um, so here we go. This one is very important to shake very well. So when you shake this with a Boston shaker, even the shaker with the, um, the strainer on the top, shake it till the tin is frosty. All right, we've got frost. And that is just so that you get proper dilution in the drink. Uh, this could kind of be a cloying drink if you don't shake it through, but if it's properly diluted, it's a perfectly balanced drink. And it's the number one cocktail that I serve to people that say they don't like gin because after they drink this cocktail, all of a sudden they like gin. So I like, uh, a coupe glass for this, an old fashioned champagne coupe. It's really nice for that. And I'm still gonna 
sh uh, because I shook the cocktail, I'm gonna find strain. And then we could take a little bit of uh, a little bit of citrus peel. This happens to be orange blossom honey that I used. So a little orange zest squeezed on the surface of the drink. Just take it zest side out, fold it in half and squeeze. You get all those nice essential oils on, on the surface of the cocktail. And then just drop it right on the side there. Uh, and this is the Broker's Gin Bee's Knees. Cheers. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah it looks good. Uh, okay, so gin uh, is one of those things that pairs very well with citrus um, and savory flavors. Uh, so... For this particular cocktail, you can have strong cheese like goat cheese, um, smoked salmon with a little spritz of uh, lemon juice, cucumber sandwiches, uh, and classic fish and chips. All of these would, would go very well with, um, with the bee's knees. You said fish and chips? Fish and chips. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting, because of the salty of the fish and chips and the sweet of the, yeah. the honey yeah. and the gin. Mm -hmm. And then also keep in mind that um, that gin is very popular in England where they tend to vinegar their fish and chips, where in America we tend to tartar sauce or ketchup or right. whatever. So that vinegar is a good balance to the sweetness in the cocktail. And funny you should say England because ah. the book that I'm pairing with the bee's knees is set in England. It is called The Beekeeper's Apprentice or On the Segregation of the Queen by Laurie King. Um, it is set in 1915 uh, in Sussex, which is in the English countryside. Um, Sherlock Holmes. As you see from the cover, you can see him here. I'm pointing at him on my screen. He's retired and he's um, studying honeybees in Sussex. Um, when uh, a woman stumbles onto him, a young woman who's actually only 15 years old on the Sussex, down Sussex Downs, which is a very beautiful um, area of England. She's um, uh, incredibly smart. And uh, he winds up tutoring her on his detective ways. And they wind up working as a team. Um, uh, they go to Wales to help Scotland Yard find the kidnapped daughter of an American senator. This book was, is the first book in what is now a 17 book series um, uh, featuring Sherlock Holmes and his young female apprentice named Mary Russell. And um, they're very popular books. And um, I had a lot of bee related titles to choose from for this one, but I, I picked this one because I, um, I think it should be better known that it is. So that's The Beekeeper's Apprentice. Okay, so now I think we're heading into the redheaded whiskey sour. I know some people are drinking that tonight. Oh, good, good. Allie. All right, so I think we had, uh, yeah, four roses for this one. All right, we're going to use the yellow label four roses. The uh, you know, entry level bourbon from these guys. This is the mingling of the 10 unique recipes from Four Roses and quite a deal and great, great press and welcomed by uh, a lot of the craft bartending community. Um, and this is a cocktail uh, that 
you know, I sort of renamed, it's not my recipe, but I did rename it. Um, it's, it's a classic New York sour. Uh, and that is to say uh, it is bourbon lemon juice and simple syrup, right? So it's actually, you, you, do you recognize that build? 211, right? This is the perfect strong to sweet to sour ratio to make a really nicely balanced cocktail. So we're gonna do the same thing here, but the real difference is right on the finish. We're gonna take a bar spoon and float a little bit of red wine on the surface. So hopefully those, uh, that produced it tonight had some luck with their float. And if not, I can answer questions. I could show you how to do it properly in a few uh, minutes here. All right. So this one is the very similar build of two ounces bourbon. This is a raw sugar, simple syrup, just that, you know, sugar in the raw and hot water combo. This is a two to one ratio. Um, so you make a, it's called, it's considered a rich simple syrup. No, uh, I've, I've most simple syrup recipes that I've seen are all one to one. Right. Um, so that's why I mentioned this is a rich yeah. simple syrup. Yeah. It's uh it's a, it's a two to one uh, simple syrup with, with raw sugar. And you, do you recommend that for whiskey sours in general? Yeah, I, I tend to, I tend to like uh, a slightly more concentrated thing. Again, it has to do with viscosity and mouthfeel. In this particular drink, we're going to add dry red wine at the end. So that's going to throw off the balance. So I prefer uh, a, a, a richer uh, syrup to start. Gotcha. Makes sense. All right. So this is one ounce of lemon juice. Uh, and then we're going to do the same thing here. a good shake not frost level but not not um really lightly shaken you want to chill this pretty nicely Good there. All right, because we shook, we're gonna take and use the mesh strainer. Catch all that ice. All right, now we take the back of a bar spoon, our red wine, and we literally pour red wine right gently, slowly, right on the surface. And if you shake nicely, you're gonna get a bit of froth, white froth on the surface. And then there's a single big ice cube in there. And it will float just like that. So that's why we call it the red-headed whiskey sour with four roses bourbon. Cheers. Mm. Excellent. <laughs> okay, so um Basically what Noah just made is a whiskey sour red wine floating on top. So you can definitely pair this with things that you would pair a whiskey sour with, um, which is uh, you can pair, um, uh, believe it or not, salad. Salad is a neutral partner uh, to whiskey. Um, you can pair it with pork ribs. It'll go well with cheeses like Roquefort, Brie, Cheddar, um, you can also pair it with chocolate. I would recommend a very dark chocolate. Um, nothing too sugary, nothing too sweet, because that's like drinking, you know, orange juice after brushing your teeth. So you definitely want a dark chocolate. <laughs> Excellent. 
just want to say that whiskey sour is my favorite drink and Noah that looked amazing yeah this uh, is yeah it, it's the element of that little bit of like um sort of tannic red wine and then um you know a bit of a you know a sort of a different dimension of acidity uh you know from the red wine it, it's this is a perennial favorite of mine and restaurants where I've put it on the menu, um, it, it d never leaves. It, it's been on for years. So. And how do you, what, how did you pick the red wine? Uh, I, I'm a sucker for, um, I'm a sucker for Italian red wine. So I happen to have a bottle of, uh, um, Chianti open. So, um, that, that works fine. But if you're a California wine drinker, that's nice. Uh, I, I tend to like something with tannin, you know, a little bit of grip. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but some people prefer, you know, something kind of juicier and richer with a little bit more oak and vanilla. But I think you've got enough oak in the whiskey. Right. Uh, that I don't, uh, that you know, I don't think it needs any more, you know, oak and vanilla. Thanks for that. So if you attended the bourbon uh, and books pairing we did in honor of the Kentucky Derby, you know that I, that I went through a full range of bourbon related books. So notwithstanding that the key ingredient in this drink is bourbon, I didn't want to do bourbon book for this one. And so I got to pick um, one of my favorite books of last year, um, which is Ann Tyler's Redhead by the Side of the Road. Um, uh, it doesn't really matter too much what this book is about. If you are a fan of Ann Tyler, you probably already read this. And if you're not, you should be. And um, this is a really good place to begin because it's one of her shorter novels. It has all of her familiar tropes. It's set in Baltimore. You have um, a dysfunctional but loving and very offbeat family with one main character who's just sort of lost, in this case, his way, but sometimes it's her way. Um, and the, the person or people who come along and help make things a little bit better. Um, I recommended this book a lot in the early months of the pandemic when people were struggling um, to, to read. They were, people were struggling. I don't know if this happened to you, but people were having a hard time concentrating enough to read a book. They were, they wanted to read, but they were just too caught up in the anxiety of the pandemic. Uh, this, and this was one of the things I recommended for people to try. It doesn't ask too much of you. Um, and it's not too long, but it is simply delightful. Um, so for your redheaded, um, whiskey sour, I recommend redhead by the side of the road. All right. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Brenda, but I believe we're on the finale. We're on the finale. You're making the drink that I made tonight. Oh, great. Great. That's a, it's a good one. It's, um, does everybody, um, know what a Negroni is? You guys can unmute and tell me what a Negroni is. Oh, I don't know what they are. They're just good. They're delicious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's nice honesty. That's good. I'll tell you what they are in a second. Anybody else? I know it's made with rye. Uh, made so with rye? the cla the classic Negroni is not made with rye, but we're going to make uh, a variation of that kind of base cocktail, but with uh, uh, whiskey tonight with bourbon. It's a gin-based cocktail typically. So a Negroni is uh, a, an equal parts drink that it contains gin, sweet vermouth, and Campari, right? So that's, it's like, the, if you like a Negroni, it's the best, safest cocktail to order when you're out at a, at a restaurant that you're kind of not sure about the quality of their cocktails. But you just go up to the bar and you could say, uh, equal parts gin, sweet vermouth, and Campari, okay? And then how could they screw that up? They, they can do it, believe me, it's happened. They, they still can screw that up. But if you just tell them equal parts 
stir it, put it on ice and, and give me a, a peel of, uh, of uh, orange or something, a wedge of orange, uh, even lemon if you're in a, in a pinch. But th that's what a Negroni is. So why am I talking about a Negroni when we're talking about a Boulevardier? Well, they're, they're very similar. These are the two similar ingredients, sweet vermouth and Campari-like ingredients. So I will talk a bit about uh, Luxardo uh, again. Luxardo, uh, this, once again, that Kleenex Q-tip thing and the cotton swab category, right? That's how most people understand that. Uh, it's just a brand. Uh, and this is an Italian red bitter. That's the category. And this is Luxardo's version. So Campari is the brand name. That's all. So uh, Campari is a multinational corporation at this point. Luxardo is still a family owned business uh, in Livorno, uh, Italy. Uh, so this is, uh, this is just like Campari. It's a, it's a fraction of the price. Uh, you just wouldn't know it. And if, if, if you guys were all to go Do to your local store it? and say uh, Luxardo Bitter in place of Campari, they could find it in the state of Connecticut from Slocum and Sons. So anyway, uh, we're going to do uh, this with Ezra Brooks uh, Sour Mash 90 Proof Bourbon. Uh, we're going to do it with the Luxardo Bitter. And I know that the, that the recipe sheet might say Carpano Antica. Uh, that's fine. That's a great vermouth as well. But tonight I'm going to use Cokie Vermouth di Torino uh, here. So uh, very similar with Carpano, if, if you need to use that. And instead of a Boston shaker that we've been in all night, we're going to use a mixing glass. So this is just a fancy mixing glass. You could use anything. Uh, uh, I've been known to use a, a, a flower vase when necessary. Uh, but this is just a nice uh, mixing glass. Uh, and we're going to take, let's see, I've just lost my spoon there. My apologies. And uh, I like a slightly elevated flavor of bourbon in this cocktail. I often drink a Negroni as an aperitif with the gin, but I like a Boulevardier as a nightcap or an after dinner drink, right? It helps in digestion. It, it's the one, two punch. It's the number two punch. You know, it, it takes you right out and you sleep like a log. Um, so I'm gonna use 1.5 ounces of the Ezra Brooks. Remember that's 90 proof too. That goes right into the mixing glass. And then an ounce of the sweet vermouth. and an ounce of the family owned version of Campari. And then all those ingredients into the mixing glass and then ice on top of that. And I'm gonna have to go fetch my uh, bar spoon, excuse me. Uh, and then we just stir. I would say 20 seconds, 25 seconds. It all depends on your ice. Most of us at home are gonna have a pretty solid cube um, from the, not kind of like what the restaurants have. So you can stir for, for like 25 or 30 seconds, probably. If you've ever been to those restaurants that have that chipped ice, they can, they can fully dilute and chill a drink in about 10 seconds. But um, I like to stir for almost 30 seconds. This is a drink that you could build directly in the glass, but um, you know I like to use I like to use the mixing glass and oftentimes pour it over fresh ice, you know. Um, but tonight, since I'm the only one here, <laughs> I'm going to use uh, the ice that I just stirred with. I'm going to go straight into that glass, and notice how I didn't strain that. With our, uh, with our mesh strainer, it's because I didn't shake it and break up any ice. So there's not gonna be any floating ice on the surface. Um, 
And so that's a Boulevardier. We could take a little bit of, uh, of orange, uh, maybe a nice wheel of orange. I'll show you a little trick here. You get one of these nice big glasses and you take a nice full slice of orange. You could go straight into the side of the glass, something like that. And that looks really nice, I think. So cheers, and uh, I'm glad I could be a part of it. Hope this was, you know, sort of um, enlightening to some, maybe, maybe not, um, but I hope you all learned something. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them on any of the products, the brands, the cocktails in general, um, please uh, feel free uh, to chime in, unmute yourself and ask away. Cheers. I'm I'm confused about the the Campari versus the Aperol versus yeah. the Italian red bitter. Yeah. Are, how are, are they, I thought the Aperol and Campari were totally different flavored. They they they, they are. They're not they're not totally different flavored. Um, Campari is a, a little bit more bracingly bitter. Right. Uh, and Aperol is a little bit more subtle and Aperol has a bit more of a flavor of, you know, orange and it, in it, it's, 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 it's much more tame compared to Campari. So for your, for your Venetian spritz. That was the aperitivo by Luxardo. Which is a red bitter. Which is a, it, it's, it's actually, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's still in that category of red bitter, uh, but it, it's a, it's a lighter version of Campari. But is Aperol a red bitter? It, it that it is it is in that same category. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It is. But uh, it it tends to, yeah. You you kind of have to know, um, the difference between the two if you were going to buy the Luxardo product. It's not as well defined and well known as the Aperol and Campari brands. Okay, thank you. Um, so last food pairing, because this um, drink does have a distinct bitterness from the um, aperitivo, you need strongly flavored foods. Um, so anything that is salty, salty, bacony, uh, cheeses like Parmesan, Romano, blue cheese, uh, bacon wrapped dates stuffed with goat cheese, um, smoked ham mac and cheese would go good with this, a grilled ribeye with blue cheese crumbles. Um, a charcuterie plate is perfect for this cocktail. Um, so choose a few strong cheeses, some smoked meat, some salty olives. Uh, this also pairs very well with chocolate. Can I just say that I want to be uh, at a party that Noah and Brenda are throwing together <laughs> uh, because these drinks sound amazing. And I'm now pondering the idea that a good a good stiff bourbon drink helps you sleep at night. I'm going, I may have to try that out, Noah, and see. Oh, I, I, I didn't know that was news to anyone. But, that was uh... news to me. <laughs> that is that is very interesting news um, yeah, yeah. okay this was my hardest one uh to do a book pairing for um so bear with me when i explain why the book i'm pairing is called pancakes in paris living the american dream in france so so the word boulevardier um means a man about town um uh, as it's used. And there's, here's the story. Um, there was this guy uh, named Harry McElhone, who was um, a man the bar at the Plaza Hotel in New York. And then America went dry in prohibition and he relocated first uh, to London um, and then to Paris. And he opened up his own place, Harry's New York bar. Um, and he served uh, Americans who were in Paris, um, the pre-prohibition cocktails and new drinks that he came up with 
um, that he created with European ingredients that they didn't have back home um, before prohibition, let alone during prohibition. Um, the uh, Boulevardier was a drink that Harry came up with. Um, it was in his 1927 bar guide, Bar Flies and Cocktails. And he created it for a guy named Erskine Gwynn, who was an expatriate writer, socialite, and a nephew of uh, Alfred Vanderbilt, the railroad tycoon. So um, Gwynn, who was hanging out in Paris drinking, edited a monthly magazine that he called the Boulevardier and meant to style on the New Yorker. Um, and so Harry came up with this drink, called it the Boulevardier um, in honor of Gwynn's magazine. So I, all of that was just a super great story to me. And so I, I went from that background on the drink um, to find this book, Pancakes in Paris, which is about this guy, Craig Carlson, who wrote it, um, who opened up an American diner in Paris. Um, he's actually from Connecticut. Um, he, he had never worked in a restaurant. He didn't know anything about starting a new business, but he went to Paris. He loved it there and he um, loved everything about it, except that he couldn't get a, an American breakfast. And that was the thing he missed. So he decided to open up a diner to, to, to bring it to, um, to Paris. So he raised the money. Um, he tracked down supplies for how to have diner food in um, Paris. And um, along the way, he fell in love. So he wrote this book. There is a, there is a diner in Paris called Breakfast in America. Um, uh, and you can go there today. Um, well, actually, maybe during COVID, you can't. But in general, you can go there. Um, and so this is his memoir about making that happen and bringing um, an American diner to Paris. And um, that is the book I paired after a lot of research and digging with the Boulevardier. Well, I think you nailed it. <laughs> that was a good one and that's that 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 book is one of my favorites the bar flies uh that's uh yeah that's a great story that that um uh history on the boulevardier so no i thought it was a great story i was really i thought it was so fun i, I have a quick question about sure. ice it was so yeah. interesting to hear you talk about ice and how little specks of ice could be left on the strainer. Yeah. There's a lot, you know, of discussion about what type of ice you should use in a certain drink and what shape of ice cubes you should use in drinks. And I know it's probably a separate top, you know, separate topic in and of itself, but do you have any re recommendations for what type of ice you would put in bourbon straight up? Or if you're gonna have ice in bourbon, would it be a big giant cube? Would it be a round cube? What do you think? Uh, so, so yeah, you sound like you've got a little bit of intel on this, like, you know, maybe those larger ice cubes, but I, I'll be right back because I'm going to show everybody what exactly what to use. Actually, if you like, if you really like bourbon, you should use the, um, Brenda, were they made out of marble? That yeah. You put in the freezer and oh, then they yeah. get the yeah. cold, but they the don't round ones? bourbon. Yep. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, um, I think they're, some are made out of marble, some are rocks. Um, you basically throw them in your freezer, they get really cold, put them in your cocktail, and they don't dilute what you're drinking. Mm. Yep, love that. Yeah, those work pretty good too, the whiskey stones. Um, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what we have. Aren't they the best? <laughs> Yeah, th 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 those are great. Yeah, they, they, they I, I like a little bit of dilution. Some some yeah. nights it depends. Yeah. Um, I'm drinking like a, a high proof scotch or something like that. I, I do, but I'll take an ice cube, one ice cube, put it in the glass, stir it with the bar spoon take and remove out. the ice cube. <laughs> just yeah. to, you know, just to take it. I don't want to over dilute it, but right. I mean, some people that would typically drink whiskey on the rocks use a large silicone mold like this. Mm -hmm. um, there's two different sizes here yep. and then uh i also have got the uh the round you know the sphere okay the ice ball 
and that yeah. makes for a that makes for a nice basically what you're trying to cut down on is surface area right okay. so the more surface area you have the more dilution you're going to get got it and ice is tremendously important when it comes to when you get to that level of like really making a nice cock like really making a nice cocktail mm -hmm. um it, ice is really important right because it's because at the very least if you're serving a drink on the rocks it's like 50 percent of the drink <laughs> true and it, and then if you're if even if you're just making a cocktail um you know you're looking at 20 percent dilution ideally and how fast you get there and you know the quality of the ice makes a big difference Gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for me? Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you're you. Welcome. Thanks, and, Noah. Yeah, you're welcome. And listen, I would appreciate if everyone, um, you know, that is uh, that uh, you know, frequent dragonfly, you know, if, if anybody likes, you know, the drinks or any of the products that we talked about tonight, you know, you can be in touch with Brenda and she has access, uh, to all of these through Slocum and Sons and, um, you know, truly everything pretty much. Yeah. Everything we used tonight, um, was a really, you know, really like a, a quality craft driven product. Um, so all of those items would be available through Brenda at Dragonfly.